Welcome to the Crazy Hat Chemist. So another video in bonding and molecular, molecular structure. So let's get moving. Bam! So today we're going to be talking about sulfur hexafluorides, molecular geometry, and oh, so much more, baby. So sulfur hexafluoride. So what's that formula? Sulfur hexa hexa is for six, not seven. That's hepta. Six is for hexa. So sulfur, so sulfur, fluorine, and a six of those, right? We're going to look on our periodic table to determine the number of valence electrons in sulfur, that's six, fluorine, that's seven. There are six of those fluorines. We're going to sum these numbers up and we're going to get 48. We're, of course, going to divide this by two and we're going to get pairs of electrons. How many pairs? 24 pairs of electrons. Now, we're going to find the least electronegative element that goes in the middle. That's going to be the sulfur. Then the fluorines are going to surround that sulfur. And then you're going to ask yourself, where is sulfur? Can I fit six fluorines? Can I fit six of anything around that sulfur? Hmm. And sulfur is what period? Period three. So therefore, sulfur can be hypervalent and it's going to exceed the octet rule. So we're going to place a pair of bonding electrons between the central element and the outside elements, and that's what we've done there. We still have more electrons. We're going to place electron pairs around the fluorine so that we get an octet around each fluorine, and that's what I've done right there. We're going to verify the octet rule for each of the fluorines because it is period two, and it must obey the octet rule, and there it does. Now, that sulfur in the middle, I already mentioned it previously, but it is period three, period three or greater, period three, four, five, six, or seven can exceed the octet rule and be hypervalent, and sulfur is an example of that. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to clean up this Lewis dot structure. We're going to draw lines as bonding pairs of electrons, leave the lone pairs of electrons as non-bonding pairs, that's dots. I don't have any more electrons, so I can't dump any more in the central element. And boy, there isn't a lot of space there anyways, huh? Okay, so... This is the Lewis dot structure that you should see. You should see that central sulfur and then singly bonded six fluorines around it. We're going to get the X, okay? The A is the sulfur. The X are the six fluorines. And the E, well, there aren't any E's on the central element, so there are no, it, there is not an E of any kind. So I just have AX6. So how many bonding domains and how many non-bonding domains on the central element? There are six bonding domains and zero non-bonding domains on the central element. Now, from either the AX6 or the six bonding and zero non-bonding, you need to memorize the name of the shape. And that name of that shape is octahedral. Okay, if it is octahedral, then what are the bond angles? Those bond angles are, of course, that's right, 90. Okay, and then from this, now we're going to get the hybridization. So we're going to count the number of bonding domains or non-bonding domains around the central element. So let's count them. S, P1, P2, P3, D1, D2. It's SP3, D2 hybridized. Beautiful. Now, in order to get the polarity, I'm going to show you this molecule here first here. Okay, here is the model of this. Okay, you should see this and how I'm turning it here. And you should see that all these bond angles are 90. It's really plainly obvious. Again, no matter how you turn this. It's really almost like a square pyramidal structure. Square pyramidal structure. There is the square. There is the square. And it's a pyramid on the top, on the bottom. It's, so it's a square bipyramidal structure. But... It has that square in the middle instead of a trigonal bipyramidal. It is a square bipyramidal structure. Okay. Now, there are six for the domains, right? And it's AX6. And everybody gets confused about this because it's like, wait, where does the octahedral name come from? And again, the octahedral name came, comes from the name of the number of sides to this here structure. So it's one, two three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight sides to this because these little guys right here are at the apex of all those, um, those uh, corners, okay? So is this symmetrical or asymmetrical, okay? So in order for it to be polar, two things must be satisfied. Number one, you have to have polar bonds. That's a large difference in electronegativity relatively. Not too large that you have something that is ionic. Okay, but does this have polar bonds? Yes, it does have polar bonds. 
That's the first criteria. That has been satisfied with this. Criteria number two is that the molecule itself needs to be asymmetric. Is this asymmetric or symmetrical? Now, um, hopefully you should see that this is most certainly symmetrical. And since it is symmetrical, then, of course, then this is nonpolar if it's symmetrical. Both criteria must be satisfied in order for it to be a polar molecule. This is not polar. It is nonpolar. Nonpolar. All right, I got a great hat here for you today if you're a basketball fan, especially in my lo local region. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you like that video. Give me a thumbs up if you like to shoot hoop. And then subscribe to my YouTube channel, and I'll see you next time. <gasps> Bam!